Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and join me in welcoming His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Indonesia, Joko Widodo. Together with His Excellency, Samdech Hun Sen, the Prime Minister of Cambodia. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Your Excellency Bapa President Jokowi, President of Indonesia, Your Excellency Prime Minister of Cambodia Sam Tesh Desh Hun Sen, Your Excellency Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam Win Suan Phuc, and Your Excellency Deputy Prime Minister of the Russian Federation Arkady Dvokovic. Ladies and gentlemen, in January, the World Economic Forum has been officially recognized as an international institution for public private cooperation. This is a major contribution to our mission committed to improving the state of the world. Because all of today's challenges like our thrive for inclusive growth, like our fight for food security or environment protection. All these challenges can neither be solved by the private sector nor by the public sector alone. You always need public-private cooperation. And you are all our guests today in our East Asia Summit under the theme anchoring trust in East Asia's new regionalism. And ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all of you to our 24th East Asia Summit under this new theme, under this new status, a warm welcome here in Jakarta. <clears throat> but what does it mean, anchoring trust? new regionalism. Let me tell you a short story. I was born in 1973 in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. I lived the first month of my life in a Catholic orphanage. I was then adopted by a German couple as a little baby, and this couple gave me the chance of my life. I grew up in Germany. I went to school, I went to university, I became a physician. I then joined later politics. I was there five years federal minister. First federal minister for health, later for economics. At the same time, I was vice chancellor of the Federal Republic, so the deputy of Chancellor Angela Merkel. And I was the first federal minister with an immigrant background, with an Asian background, with an Asian face. So indeed, thanks to my parents, I got the chance of my life. And thanks to my country, Germany. But ladies and gentlemen, this is not a story about my parents. This is not a story about my country. This is a story about East Asia. Because in the last 40 years, 
since I left East Asia, the region has totally changed its face. Your fathers and your grandfathers have created the great idea of the ASEAN community, which is becoming more and more reality. And look around you. We have so many fast-growing societies, fast-growing middle classes, and dynamic economic growth. Look, for example, into the impressive numbers of our host state, Indonesia. 860 billion GDP, 6% expected growth for this year. Rank 34 in our World Economic Competitiveness Report. And as interesting, an expected 70 million Facebook user by the end of the year. And we have similarly encouraging macroeconomic data in the entire region. A lot of achievements. But at the same time, we still have important questions to answer, such as, can we close faster the educational, the talent, the gender gap? How can companies and public institutions strengthen the ASEAN economic community? Can we build up fast enough infrastructure for the people? Can we leapfrog the health systems? What about the future of energy? A lot of questions due to a lot of transformations. But in the spirit of public-private cooperation, we can address all these challenges. Because you, as our today's guest, you are a real multi-stakeholder community. We have more than 700 participants today. And you all have one major thing in common. You're all leaders. Political leaders, our heads of state and government, we have 30 ministers. We have a lot of representatives of international institutions, organizations, and NGOs. We have more than 500 business leaders from all the industries, including other social entrepreneurs. We have leaders in academia, science, arts, 200 media leaders. And of course, we have also the next generation of leaders, the youth. And as leaders, you all know the three main pillars of leadership. First, you must have the courage to take decisions. Second, you must be competent to take the right decisions. And third, you must have the capability to motivate people to turn decisions into reality. And therefore, trust is decisive. Trust is key. Trust is critical. Trust is the glue which holds a society as well a region together. Without trust, there is no motivation. Without motivation, there is no leadership. Without leadership, we will never overcome our challenges. But the good news today is that it's hard to imagine a more capable group than you to pose all these challenges to. You are leaders. You are trusted leaders. And we, as a World Economic Forum, as trusted partner in transformation, we would like to offer to you this summit as a platform for real public-private cooperation in order to create trust, in order to create leadership, to lead East Asia into a better future. And finally, if we keep all the commitments we will agree in this summit, then one day, maybe in 10 years, someone else will welcome you then to the 34th East Asia Summit. And he, or maybe much better she, will then tell her story that she maybe was adopted from somewhere else in the world to East Asia, that she grew up in East Asia, that she went to school, went to university, could make her career in business, politics, or both. To put it in a nutshell, that she as well got the chance of her life here in East Asia. And of course, it's not on us to define her way of life or any way of life but to create a peaceful and prosperous region that 
Ladies and gentlemen, that is the reason why we are here today. So again, a warm welcome to our East Asia Summit 2015. Thank you very much. And now it's my honor, my pleasure, to ask the Deputy Prime Minister Vokovic to make some welcome remarks to the plenary. Thank you, Philip. Uh, uh, President of the Republic of Indonesia. Yagmule Bapa, President of the Republic of Indonesia, Excellency President of the Republic of Indonesia, esteemed, collect, uh, esteemed colleagues, participants of the forum. I am glad to be a guest for today's forum in Indonesia, and thank you so much for the opportunity to address you today. At present, Asia-Pacific region and East Asia have become the main drivers of global economic growth and will remain such drivers for the foreseen future. Now, Asia-Pacific region has got 60 percent of world GDP and for about 45 percent of total volume of their entrance border investment. Economical growth of the countries of the regions uh, sustainably exceeds 5 percent. This defines interests of Russia as well as of other big countries of the region to participate in the cooperation with Asia-Pacific region. This interest is based on deep and good traditions of harmonical development and hardworking people of the region. Asia-Pacific region is one of the key regions for cooperation uh, with Russia, and ASEAN is one of the, our permanent countries. As a proverb says, there is no point in clapping by one hand. We are based that today Russia as well as Asian countries are solving common problems of increasing their GDP growth and increasing the quality of life of their peoples. During the latest time, the ties between Russia and ASEAN countries have increased greatly. Since the first summit, the volume of our bilateral trade has increased with more than 5% till $21.5 billion in 2014. The most interesting spheres of our cooperation are energy, transportation, um, agriculture. And we have good will to cooperate in these spheres. We see good perspectives to develop cooperation with our partners in ASEAN to supply liquefied gas with the, using the uh, North Sea route in the supplying of our aircraft helicopters and to develop other uh, industries to create uh, satellite systems and joint mechanisms of uh, uh, industrial development. We are ready to join uh, the uh, transportation systems, including uh, the usage of GLONASS systems and GPS. As an important vector of the uh, economical politics of Russia is to join the processes in ASEAN countries, um, and including the participation of our regions uh, of Siberia and Far East. We are uh, ready to establish contacts between the Eurasia, uh, Eurasian uh, community with the future ASEAN uh, economic uh, community. Uh, we are talking about on uh, signing of the free trade agree agreement with Vietnam, uh, and we have a good uh, uh, cooperation here. We hope it will give uh, good opportunities for the development of our further relations with the ASEAN countries. We do not have common borders with ASEAN, but nevertheless, we are talking about um, 
our interest to develop uh, a cooperation in uh, quite a number of spheres, uh, including e-commerce. We are developing technologies for this. The results of the recent visits of the chairman of the government of the Russian Federation, Mr. Medvedev, to Vietnam and Thailand has once, have once again confirmed similarity of our interests in ASEAN track. A mutual desire for increase in multifaceted cooperation, first of all, in such uh, key spheres as um, I have mentioned already. Not less um, uh, active our relationship with, Indone uh, with Indonesia now. We have a regular political dialogue between our presidents, including on the sidelines of international forum. Uh, this gives a good opportunity to develop good cooperation between our countries. Uh, just uh, recently, in November 2014, our President Vladimir Putin has met uh, His Excellency Mr. Joko Widodo, the President of the Indonesia, and um, he uh, intended to develop active ties with the Republic of Indonesia. My today's uh, talks uh, with colleagues here have shown the desire to work together. Uh, we would like to work together to counter challenges and threats uh, in the world. Recently, Russia have started uh, several big projects in Indonesia, including the project of building a railway uh, and uh, alumni refinery and some other interesting projects. We also welcome investments from ASEAN countries to Russian economy, and we are open for such kind of cooperation. One of the most interesting uh, spheres of cooperation is agriculture, but we also would like to work together in uh, traditional spheres of cooperation, such as mining and others, including the um, cooperation with uh, Singapore, for example, I would say that uh, Singapore actively participated in modernization the airports uh, in Sochi. We are ready to move towards widening of cooperation with ASEAN countries. To conclude, I would like to underline that our partners in uh, Southeast Asia are very reliable. They are very ready to work together despite of global politics. And this is our common approach, and that's why we came here. We are open to uh, realize joint projects, and we are ready to, 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 to develop our cooperation in the spirit of friendship uh, for the benefits of our people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister Dvokovic. And I would like to ask the Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam to announce all his speeches, his welcome remarks to the audience. Uh, Excellency Joko Widodo, President of the Republic of Indonesia, Excellency Samdap Hun Sen, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Cambodia, Excellency leaders, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to attend the 24th World Economic Forum on East Asia, organized in Jakarta, the capital of the beautiful and hospitable country of Indonesia. I would like to thank Excellency President Joko Widodo and the WEF for giving me the opportunity to address this prestigious forum to share with you some thoughts on cooperation to build a bright future for East Asia in the new global context. Excellency President, ladies and gentlemen, Increasingly substantial cooperation and multidimensional and multilayered linkages have become the major trends in East Asia. The establishment of the ASEAN community by 2015 opens up a new era for development in East Asia. It can be said that East Asia, more than ever before, are enjoying great opportunity for cooperation and development. However, this is all the time that East Asia is facing many challenges. Many economies in the regions are suffering from decline in growth rate, strategic 
competition, territorial disputes, environmental protection, climate change, navigation and overflight safety and security, among others, are challenging regional stability and development. Therefore, the theme East Asia in the new global context of our opening ceremony today is totally relevant to the common interest of East Asian countries. And reality shows that after every crisis, Asian economies rise up more strongly with the firm determinations and reform efforts. That is the reason why many Asian countries are promoting structural reforms, enhancing governance capability, developing infrastructure, education, health, science, and technology. This is the south path forward as domestic reform is a decisive factor to the formation of a more resilient economy in the new global context so that we can bring about the benefits of international integration to the people. And for Vietnam, we are exerting great efforts to complete the market economy, promote economic restructuring, and transform growth model to build the best business environment and build a more competitive economy going hand in hand with social justice and environmental friendliness. East Asia's strong growth is not only for its own benefit, but also to contribute significantly to resolving common issues of the whole world. Each individual will become stronger if he is shared and supported. Therefore, economic linkages among regions should be further deepened and vitalized. The establishment of the ASEAN community together with the cooperation mechanisms among regional countries between Europe and Asia, between the two Pacific Ocean banks, will open up new opportunities opportunity and create new momentum for development for East Asia and its partners. Besides the responsible contribution to the ASEAN building, Vietnam has concluded FTA negotiations with the Republic of Korea and Customs Union of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, and is actively promoting the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP as well as try to conclude the regional comprehensive economic partnership. Any business that has the desire to expand investment in East Asia should not miss the business opportunity brought about by these agreements. As the President, ladies and gentlemen, Finally, it is very important to bear in mind that integration and development in East Asia would only be secured when regional peace and stability are consolidated. Differences and disputes should be resolved through peaceful measures with respect to international law, along with sincerity and trust. Directly concerning our region is development in the East Sea all disputes in the sea need to be solved through peaceful measures on the basis of the international law, including the 1982 United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea. Cooperation, mutual respect and trust, shared responsibility over common issues are indispensable factors to ensure the sustainable development of the entire region. Vietnam will stand side by side with our other countries and partners in these endeavors. It is still a long and challenging way ahead. The future of East Asia depends on our ability, on the ways and means we respond to changes in the region and the world. I hope that WEFT on East Asia this year will put forward many initiatives and ideas on how to boost cooperation for sustainable development in East Asia in the new context. May I wish Excellency President and all of you the best of health and success. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. And now it's my honor to ask the Prime Minister of Cambodia to make his speech to our participants. Excellencies, Joko Widodo, President of the Republic of Indonesia, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and my colleagues to this 24th World Economic Forum on East Asia. I would like to congratulate and express a profound gratitude to the government and people of the Republic of Indonesia, the host country, for their excellent arrangement of this forum and for the warm hospitalities extended to all the distinguished guests, including Cambodian delegation. Over the past years, 
East Asia region has been successful in maintaining peace, stability, vibrant economic growth, and sustainable development that has enabled our region to play a vital role in driving and sustaining the world's economic recoveries from recent global financial downturns. In addition, our regional integration has been progressing remarkably well and deeply rooted through important mechanisms such as especially the East Asia Summit with ASEAN being the centralities and the catalyst. However, in the context of rapidly changing global political, economic, and financial architectures, as characterized by steady rise of multipolar tendencies, I'm of the view that countries in the region have to adhere to their long-term vision and proactive approaches toward promoting and ensuring sustainable development. In this period, I would like to highlight some major tasks which should be part of our regional priority agenda. First, further promoting cooperation to ensure peace, security, and firm stability to trust building measures and consultation, including resolution of regional issues by peaceful means and in accordance with the principle of international law. Second, exerting efforts to ensure a balanced, sustainable, and inclusive economic growth through implementation of prudent macroeconomic and financial policies and in-depth structural reforms while paying attention to human resource development in order to strengthen the resiliency of economic and financial system and enhance regional competitiveness for both investment attraction and social equities. Third, further promoting deeper regional integration in all sectors especially through improved connectivities in all aspects such as physical, institutional, and people-to-people -people connectivities. One of the major priorities is to accelerate the conclusion of a regional comprehensive economic partnership that will be accounting for about half of the world's population and almost 30% of the global economy. It is certain that by the end of 2015, ASEAN economic communities will become a major market that provides numerous opportunities for businesses and investment in every sectors. However, the conclusions of a wider regional trade agreement will create even greater investment opportunities as well as further promoting economic and trade activities. Allow me to elaborate a bit in addition to what the, the two situation that there should not be a confrontation but should be complement each other. It's on the point that we have two mechanisms today that is now operational. One is Trans-Pacific, which includes America and a number of countries, plus some of ASEAN countries. And another mechanism is a, a, a comprehensive economic partnership which signed in Phnom Penh in the year 2012 during the time Cambodia chair ASEAN. Then it includes 10 ASEAN countries, plus some countries like India, Japan, China, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. So these two mechanisms should not become a confrontation, but complementary. What should be, uh, what is a good feel that we should review again that why Trans-Pacific, 
did not include the ten ASEANs as a partners. That's the point. It's a serious question myself. What is the real purpose, real intention of establishing of Trans-Pacific? Have any real goal that they include half of ASEAN to be partners of Trans-Pacific and leaving half of ASEAN outside? That's the point I would like to devolve Economic Forum on East Asia to provide consideration and debate. As a member of G20, I we'll pay attention to that too. Posting the such a question, there are 10 ASEAN countries, why they include only half? Post a question in this World Economic Forum of East Asia. Fourth, we are still facing with common and universal challenges, including the economic and financial crisis, food and energy securities, climate change, natural disasters, terrorism, and cross-border crimes. These challenges cannot be solved at the country level, but it requires closer collaboration with deeper and comprehensive approaches, both at the regional and global levels. Thus, enhancing the effectiveness of a regional cooperation to effectively and timely respond to those challenges is one of our utmost priorities for now and for the medium to the long term. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in an effort to cope with the rapidly changing global environment, and as our country is located in this dynamic region, the royal government of Cambodia is firmly committed to seize every opportunity and make the best use of them for sustainable development. Being a responsible member in this regional grouping, Cambodia stands ready to join hands with all stakeholders and make necessary efforts in coping with our challenges and ensuring long-lasting peace, stability, and prosperity for the whole region. And finally, may I wish the forum great success. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister of Cambodia. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to introduce to you the president of our host state, the president of Indonesia, Papa President Jokovi, the floor is yours. Your Excellencies, our CEO, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Jakarta, welcome to Indonesia. I am pleased that you are here this week, a historic week because we are also hosting the 60th anniversary of the Asia Africa Conference in Bandung. We are here this week to talk to talk, but more importantly, to listen. I have asked my ministers to be very honest about our challenges. I have asked my ministers to listen. But I hope that after spending this week in Jakarta, you will also see our amazing opportunities. Please come and invest in Indonesia. If you have any problem, call me. <laughs> uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, the world is in a fundamental transition. For us in Indonesia and for all emerging markets, the condition is suddenly very challenging. But where we see challenges, I see opportunity. In fact, our challenges are your opportunities. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have just returned from an official visit to Tokyo and Beijing. And after many meetings with President Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, I would like to share with you I am extremely optimistic. I believe China and Japan today enjoy the best leadership they have had in a generation. And I believe this is to the great benefit of Asia as a whole. If there is one thing that Prime Minister Abe, President Xi, and I can agree on, it is that the world is changing very fast. China is changing. Japan is changing. And Indonesia is changing. I believe. Indonesia has to change. Why do I believe Indonesia has to change? Because my people tell me, my people tell me that our country has to change. Every week and every month, I go into the villages. I go into the cities and my people ask me, Mr. Jokowi, please change our country. Within this global transition, our task is clear. We have to reinvent our economies. We have to reinvent our societies. Let me share with you a story. We have been here before, in the 1970s. Indonesia became rich on export of crude oil. Crude oil was booming. Oil prices hit a record high. At the time, Indonesia was the only member of OPEC from Asia. Our energy minister, Subroto was Secretary General OPEC. Then, in 1980, the price crude oil crashed. By then, oil and gas export were 80% of our total export. We were forced to devalue our currency. We had an economic crisis. But with crisis came opportunity. Again, with crisis came opportunity. After the 1980 oil prices crash, Indonesia began to industrialize. Over the next 15 years, we built up textile and garment industry, furniture industry, pulp and paper industry, palm oil industries, chemical industries. By 1995, oil and gas export were only 30% of our total export. 
export of goods and services were 70%. Today, we are in the same situation. Commodity prices have crashed. Our currency has been hit. This is causing a lot of pain for a lot of people. But let me tell you, we have done it before, and we shall do it again. Our commodity riches made us over consumptive. We neglected our human resources. Our currency, the rupiah, has been shaken. Today, we must shift from consumption to back to production, from consumption to investment, investment in our infrastructure, investment in our industry, but most importantly, investment in our human capital, the most precious resource of the 21st century. Change can be painful. Change will create winners and losers. But there can be no progress without change. There can be no gain without pain. Even with the pain, my people tell me every week and every month, please, Mr. Jokowi, change our country. Our people are very wise. They recognize that to have progress, there must be sacrifice. Fortunately, Story is on our side. I would even say God is on our side. After the 1997 Asian financial crisis, a lot of people around the world ask, will Indonesia survive? Today, almost 20 years later. We are a vibrant and stable democracy. Our unity in diversity, what we call Bineka Tunggal Ika, is stronger than ever. We have become the fifth largest economy in Asia and a key member of the G20. The Indonesia people are wise. They are resourceful. And therefore, I'm here to tell you with 100% confidence, Indonesia will prevail. Again, 100% confident Indonesia will prevail. When you spend time with Indonesia, especially on Facebook and Twitter, you will find our people have incredible humor. Our people have incredible courage. Our people have incredible wisdom. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I stand here today to invite you to join me and my people on an incredible journey, on an incredible adventure. 
and to make incredible profits. And if you have any problem, call me, call me. Thank you, thank you.